Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. That's where we left off a few weeks ago. Who am I? I joined the others of my chosen profession in 1941. Outwardly, I appeared no different from the other students in my graduating class, but there was a fundamental difference. I believed in Jesus Christ as my Lord and intended to practice this belief in my medical practice. By 1953, with the help of a neurosurgeon, I developed a revolutionary procedure to drain away water on the brain that killed 90% of its victims before they were two years old. Babies once doomed to death lived to become healthy children. Over the next two decades, I single-mindedly pursued a dream to establish the country's very first infant intensive surgical care unit and a total care pediatric facility. In 1974, I tackled an operation other doctors declared impossible, the separation of the Rodriguez-Siamese twin girls, whose internal connections were multiple and very complex. The day of the operation began in the usual way for me, with prayer and Bible reading. A verse in Psalms which said, The Lord will support the righteous, became my help in the time of need. Claiming the righteousness of Jesus Christ, I said, We're going to win. And we did. I love children, especially the deformed and the unlovely ones. God has given me the ability to see beyond the brokenness of their unique and to see their unique spirits and the possibility of what they could become. Never have I felt more crushed than the day in 1973 when the Supreme Court legalized abortion. Since that day, I have not ceased to call my fellow physicians to oppose this great sin. Even though violently opposed by many bitter enemies, I was nominated by President Reagan and confirmed by the Senate to be Surgeon General of the United States. Who am I? By now, most of us recognize C. Everett Koop. And even though violently opposed for nine long months, not a single witness could point out a blemish in him or in his professional credentials. George Sweeting, in his book, You Can Climb Higher, makes this evaluation. C. Everett Koop is a man committed to excellence. He knows that a life yielded to God is simultaneously dedicated to quality. I want to repeat that last sentence again. He knows that a life yielded to God is at the very same time, it can be no other way, also dedicated to quality. It has to be that way. What a fantastic commentary on the life of any individual. The Bible says it like this, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. I want to suggest to you this morning that that is our standard. That is the Christian standard of performance. That is the Christian standard of excellence, to do everything that we do in order that an excellent God would receive glory and would be made known. Maybe you've thought along with me, wouldn't it be great if God would just give us a clear and a concise definition of what excellence means in our life and in our ministry? Wouldn't it be great if he just spelled it out for us in one place so we could all see it? Well, amazing as it may seem, there is just such a passage in 1 Timothy chapter 4. And that passage I want to share with you, it'll come about as close as, as any I can find. It's 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. Now, I'll be there in just a moment, but we need to back up to verse 6 and get a running start at it. Verse 6 is where we left off about three weeks ago. Follow along as I read. If you point these things out to the brothers, that's the things we'd talked about in verses 1 through 5, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, brought up in the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Now, I want you to note the phrase before I go any further. You will be a good minister of Christ Jesus. We're speaking to excellency. 
in our Christian life. Paul, as he writes his son in the faith, says, I want you to be a good minister of Christ Jesus. I can almost hear him say, I don't care if you have the voice of an angel and can hold thousands of people spellbound. I don't care if you are the most eloquent of teachers or if your testimony simply holds people in silence. No matter what your contribution is to the body of Christ, your major goal is to be a good minister for Christ Jesus. That's good for me to read. For in our day of celebrities and superstars and showboats and hot dogs, it's wonderful to come back to a basic passage that tells it to us straight. You cannot find a more significant goal to pursue in your life than to be a good minister of Christ Jesus. When your head sinks in the pillow at night, when you turn the lights out and you have a chance to pass the day in review, the question you need to answer is, This day was I a good minister of Christ Jesus. As I practiced my profession, as I spoke on the phone, as I met the public, as I worked in my home, as I fulfilled the assignments as an employee, was I a good minister of Christ Jesus? That's our goal. God calls us to excellent work, to be better than good. He calls us to excellent ways. We must be excellent just as he is excellent. That's his plan for us. God calls us to 100% commitment. He calls us to be our very finest. What I have to say this morning will seem a little peculiar to many, especially in the light of the fact that many people see how little they can do to get by. It seems as if their Bible reading can be measured in teaspoonfuls. It seems as though they spend just moments in prayer or an occasional Sunday service and just a little of their income is given to the Lord's work. And to begin to talk of excellence seems to be a foreign thought in our day. But my point will simply be this. The God that we serve is excellent in all of his ways. Psalms 8 verse 9 says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your ways in all of the earth. And if we have been called as good ministers to make known an excellent God, I suggest to you then that our life must also meet the standard of excellence in all of its ways. And so when we get to verse 10, look at it with me. Paul puts it to a straight. He says, and for this, that is this excellency, we labor and we strive. Verse 11, Timothy, command and teach these things. Verse 12, don't let anyone look down on you because of your youth when you begin to teach and live excellency. Look at the rest of verse 12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example, and here it is. Spelled out to us so that we cannot mistake it. But set an example for the believers in, first of all, speech. Second, in life. Third, in love. Fourth, in faith. And finally, in purity. You want to put in a nutshell, one, two, three, four, five. The kind of life that measures up to excellency you begin to evaluate these five areas in your life and see how you measure. As for me, I like things spelled out like this, one through five, speech, life, love, faith, purity. It's almost as if Paul was saying, there's your goal, now go for it. Now let's take each one of these five. We've got just a little bit of time to do that. Like uh, taking a star with five points that's shining very bright. And let's hang a thought on each one of these five points of the star. We're going to let them be speech, life, love, faith, and purity. And whether we're young or whether we're old has really little or nothing to do with it. These are the things that are to measure and to judge our excellency. Let's take them one at a time. First, excellence in speech. D.L. Moody, very famous evangelist of about 100 or so years ago, once said if an individual were able to come to this country and declared he was able to photograph the heart, he would die of starvation before he found his first customer. That's because none of us want our hearts photographed. Oh, I'm not talking about our physical heart. 
I'm talking about the heart from which the things that we really are begin to flow. But the fact of the matter is, every day our heart is photographed and is put on display by the words that we speak. I love this catchy epitaph that was written on a tombstone in England. Beneath this stone, a lump of clay, lies Clarabella Young, who on the 24th of May began to hold her tongue. James says it better. He says the tongue is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person. It sets the whole course of his life on fire. And it itself is a fire set by hell. What he is doing is describing the speech common in the world. The speech that we hear and so often fall prone to ourselves is belching out filth of the heart. The lustful heart is communicated through the tongue. If lust is in the heart, it will come out by the speech that we give. Bitterness of the soul, which we think we've hidden away, comes out through our speech. It's there. Pride of life, which we try to disguise in so many ways, is seen and is heard through our tongue and through our speech. The same is true with selfishness, with power, with revenge. All of these things are communicated by our speech. Paul, when he writes to Timothy and says, set an example in speech, let it be excellent in all of its ways, is making the point that it is impossible to declare the excellency of God if our speech is set on fire by the flames of hell. There have been times that I have said things that if I could, I would give everything within my power to take back the words that I have spoken. No sooner have they passed my lips, I understand that what I have put on display is something far less than excellency in my Christian life. The mental picture that I would paint for you would be taking a feather pillow, slitting one side of it open on a windy day, and then shaking and allowing the feathers to blow everywhere, and then on a calm day coming back and trying to accumulate and collect the feathers that are scattered. It's impossible. And the same thing is true with our speech. So Paul says, let your speech be excellent. Timothy, set an example. You'll be a good minister if you do. Here's a practical test for excellency in speech. I'll put it right down on the bottom shelf where all of us can reach it. Before I speak, my words must pass these three gates if they would be excellent. First of all, as I speak, I must attest to the fact, is what I am about to say true? It's not a bad test. Second, is it kind? You can be very true, still not very kind. And third, is it necessary? Or is it just idle jabbering? When my speech passes these three tests, it's true, it's kind, and it's necessary, then I am setting on display, I am... Second, Timothy, set an example of excellence in your life. I've made it a practice to observe Christians. It's a great hobby. You ought to do it sometime. You know, it's like going to a shopping mall and just watching people walk by. You know how interesting that is? Observe your brothers and your sisters in the Lord. I've made a practice of this, and I have discovered a common trait that marks those who excel for Christ. A common trait in all of their lives is a burning desire to live a life that makes a difference. Paul is telling Timothy, live that kind of life. The kind of life that is geared to make a difference in the world that it inhabits. The ingredients of a life like this are really very simple. First of all, a heartfelt commitment to Jesus Christ. And second of all, a willingness to try. You see, it's only the strength of a firm commitment to Christ that can guide us to excellence in life. Commitment moves on where emotions leave off. Commitment makes it possible for us to do our very best, not only today, but tomorrow, next year, ten years from now. My love for my wife, Sandy, will be greater ten years from now than it is today because there is commitment in my life to that marriage. 
My love for Jesus Christ and his church will be greater 10 years from now than it is today because there is commitment inside my heart. It's something that will move me on even when my emotions subside. You want excellence in your life, in every area of your life. Allow commitment to be the guiding star. If I've committed to Christ, truly committed, every action will be calculated to reveal Christ. Everything that I do, that will be the reason I do it. Indeed, my life will be a series of attempts to make God known. Oh, I won't always succeed, but I'll keep trying. I came across this a few weeks ago. Before Thomas Edison successfully invented the incandescent light bulb, he was taunted by one wag who said, 10,000 experiments and you haven't learned a thing. To which Edison responded, you're wrong. I've learned 10,000 ways not to invent the incandescent electric light bulb. A lot of days I feel the very same way. I want to say to myself, Tommy, you've tried 10,000 ways to serve God and you haven't learned a thing. But it's not true. Every day my life is changing from glory into glory. Whether you see it or not, it's happening. It's there. And I'm not afraid to keep trying and I'm not afraid to fail. Indeed, I know I won't fail because I'm more than a conqueror. We learn excellence in our Christian life by doing, in every area, by stepping out, taking a chance or a risk to be something for the Lord. Few of us ever study a manual to learn how to ride a bike. We learn by trying. This week I was teaching my oldest daughter how to ski. Now, that's like the blind leading the blind. But... <laughs> I was holding her in the water, and bless her heart, she was willing to try. Because she thought it would please her dad if she tried. But she didn't really have a commitment to what she's doing. Because, you know, I'll give this a one-time shot, just to get you off my back. I'll try. You put the two things together, commitment and a willingness to try. You've got the ingredients in Jesus Christ for a successful and an excellent Timothy, people are watching you. Your life's an open book. Set an example in your life. Turn your commitment into action. That's what he's saying. Well, let's go on. Third, Timothy, let your excellence show forth. Reveal God in love. What better way to be a good minister than training ourselves in excellent love? What better way to reveal a God of love than to strive for excellence in love? We need excellent love today because... So many use this word carelessly and incorrectly. Sometimes the word is used romantically, but that is not excellent love. That's, that's a sub, subpar form of it. Some use the word love to describe lust, and that again is not excellent love. The only love that leads to excellence is God's love. The last verse of 1 Corinthians 12 says, And now I will show you a more excellent way. You want to know the way to walk the path. I will show you the excellent way. It is the way of love. It's a love that's holy, a love that's humble, honest, faithful. Excellent love is tougher than we can imagine. Excellent love suffers, it bears, it endures. The good minister knows excellent love means staying and hanging in there, even when the going gets tough. It means hanging in there with a husband when things are going wrong or with a wife. That's excellent love. Show it. Excellent love is the day-by-day -day battle to put aside your desires in order to minister to others. Too often we fail to show such love. What we do is we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, but we just as soon put aside what it means to follow him. Paul says, have nothing to do with that kind of thinking, Timothy. You want excellence in your life. You want to know what it means to be a good minister for Christ Jesus. Set the example in the kind of love that you show. Fourth, excellence in faith. Excellence in my way of thinking begins with the question, shall I believe in God and Jesus Christ? Now that's a fundamental question. Because when I answer that question, and the way that I answer that question, puts me on one side or the other of a very important issue. Am I a part of those who believe? 
Or am I a part of those who must see in order to believe? When I answer that question positively, when I say to myself and from my heart of hearts, yes, I believe in Jesus Christ. Yes, I believe that his life, his death, and his resurrection were for me. Yes, I believe that his life made a difference for me. Yes, I believe that I am more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. That is where excellence begins. Now hear me carefully here. Sometimes trusting him and having that kind of faith becomes very difficult. But that's what sets us apart. That's what calls us to excellence. I'm a part of those who say, even though I don't see with my own eyes, even though I can't reach out and touch it with my hands, still I choose to believe. And when I take that fundamental step, I have begun to prepare myself for excellence. You see, real faith often demonstrates itself by trusting God when there is no reason to. Real faith, faith that reveals the excellency of God, is trusting God for the impossible. We reveal the excellency of his name when we resist the fear, when we put aside the panic and the confusion that would come when we don't see things happening the way we think they should, and choose in our heart of hearts still to trust God. Paul calls on Timothy to conquer such panic. You know what panic is? It's really doubt that's grown larger and larger until it turns into fear. That's panic. And sometimes we face that. I mean, eyeball to eyeball in our life. We look at things that are really tough. They're difficult. And the first emotion that begins to grip, grip us is panic. It's fear. What is it? It's doubt that's grown larger and larger. I have a word from the Lord for you this morning if you're facing panic. That word tells us that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And if he be for us, who, tell me who, can be against us? Too often our faith fails to reveal the excellency of God because we have a faith just for the short run, just for when things are going fine, but it's not for the long haul. We have enough faith to make it through the first few months of a crisis. Oh, I can get, I, oh, it's tough. I can make it for this week, but Lord, it better not stretch into the second week. I might make it through this month, but you better have it cleared away by next month. But excellent faith not only trusts when things get tough, but it hangs in there over the long haul. When it starts stretching out to three and four months, seven and eight months, a year, excellent faith still hangs on there. This past week, um, my uncle um, on my mother's side passed away in California. Now, some of you might know him. He's Alan Snyder. He spoke for us once here. His wife played the piano. And I was visiting him this uh, winter. And then he thought he had the flu. And he wasn't feeling real good. But soon after my visit, he discovered that it was cancer. And the doctor said, really, you only have a few months to live. And indeed, he passed away this past week. I called him a couple of weeks ago just to check in with him. I says, how are things going, Uncle Alan? He says, well, quite frankly, they're going pretty tough. But my trust and my confidence is still in God. And whether I live or whether I die, he'll receive the glory. I like that. That's excellent faith. I mean, that's not, that's not just average stuff. That sets us apart from the rest of the world. I mean, the rest of the world can demonstrate average faith. But average faith doesn't reveal an excellent God. It's when we have to trust him for the impossible and over the long haul. When that kind of faith hangs in there, oh, we might be going through a tough time and it may be hurting every step of the way, but every step of the way we are making God known, we're revealing him as excellent. Uh, fifth, Timothy. Be excellent in purity. Now, I didn't choose to put this in last. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, did. Let's see what he says. Timothy, set an example for the other believers. Not just in your speech, 
or in your life, in your love, or in your faith. But it's important to reveal the excellency of God through the purity of your life. Purity is something we are before it becomes something that we do. Can I say that again? Purity is something that we are before it becomes something that we do. When I begin to come to grips with who I am in the Lord, I am a new creation in Jesus Christ. That's me. That's who I am. And being new in Christ Jesus sets me apart and makes me different. And the purity of my life and the purity of your life flows from the knowledge of who we are. We will show the excellency of God by training ourselves first to be pure. Then we can act pure. Paul tells Timothy in verse 12, determine in your mind who you are. Get it straight, Timothy. You're a new creature fashioned in God's image. Perhaps you work with someone who expects moral compromises from you. Those things that are less than the purity that really is who you are. If you're not able to resist the influence, then don't hang around. Quit the job. Do it. It's more important to demonstrate the excellency of God in purity than to gain the positions that this world would offer us. If you struggle with lust, then for heaven's sakes, don't watch provocative television programs. Don't read questionable magazines. You have the mind and the power of Christ. You don't have to yield to those temptations. Unfortunately, many Christians do not feel compelled to this level of excellency. It seems as though saying no is something that has gone out of style. We're more into doing what comes naturally. It amazes me how many Christians have been duped and fooled and are surprised to see how easy it is for them to fall into temptation, almost as if because they are a Christian they would never face temptation. That's not true. Paul knew better. He said, Timothy, train yourself to be godly. That's in verse 8, 7 and 8. Train yourself. Pummel your body. Beat yourself black and blue if necessary. Godliness will not happen automatically. Train yourself to be godly. Set an example. Go for it like a dog after a bone. The pursuit of excellence is not just for the privileged few, like a C. Everett Koop. Nor is excellence reserved for the superstars or for those who are geniuses in this life. It's for each of us, whoever we are, wherever we are, whatever we're doing. Too many of us settle for mediocre Christianity. Just that which will get us by. The fact of the matter is that will never reveal the excellency of an excellent God. We can never reveal him when we just give to him 40%, 50 or even 85% of our commitment. Average effort will never shine through. The call today like it never was before is for excellence. Church, here's the call this morning. Excellence in speech. Let the words of your mouth, the meditations of your heart, bring glory. Excellency in the life that you live, every area, not just that which is visible and is set on display on Sunday morning, but in your home. Show excellency as a father, as a mother, as a husband, as a wife, as an employee, as an employer, as a student, every area of your life. Let excellency be your trademark in love. Redefine love for the world around you. Show them a love that hangs tough, that hangs in there, that doesn't bail out when things are going wrong. Excellency in faith, a faith that's for the long haul, that really believes, that knows that whether we live or whether we die, everything is being done to the excellency of God. Excellency in purity. This week I'll be meeting with the staff of the church for a couple of days, getting away. And my call to them will be one of excellency in ministry. But before I talk to them, I want to talk to you. Just like Paul called Timothy, he calls us to excellency. Lord, again we bow in your presence. Just to think that our purpose in life, our great pursuit, is to be a good minister of Christ Jesus. 
And the only way we can do that, the only way we can reveal your mercy and your glory is to live a life that is truly excellent in all of its ways. Lord, we set our heart upon it. We go after it like a dog after a bone. It's something that we want. Lord, make us uh, first excellent in our individual lives and our families. And may we bring that excellently into our, our body of believers, this church. May we in all ways reveal the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen.